This whale of a video is brought to you by Brilliant. Stick around to the end to learn how you can take your STEM knowledge to the next level. Now that is a very monstery looking whale Pokemon. It reminds me of Zilla from Monster Rancher. Well, well, walking whales, what's that about? And what's an ice type Arctic whale doing in the hot and dry Paldea region? Which is based on the Iberian Peninsula. I mean, they do have some pretty tall icy mountain ranges there, but still it feels odd. Well, I'm about to explain why this Japanese cryptid Norse Spanish creature is just so dang brilliant. It is so cool. Just like the three arctic whales that inspired its main body. So, Cititan, it's an icy whale with spikes on its face. I mean, yeah, Cititan is based on a narwhal, of course! Narwhals! Narwhals! Swimming in the ocean? Causing a commotion? Because it's the Middle Ages and con men are making a killing by killing narwhals, taking their horns, and selling them to European kings, nobles, and popes as a magical cure-all like a unicorn horn? Yeah! And that is one reason why Cititan is in this Spanish region. Unicorn horns, which were actually narwhal horns because unicorns aren't real and neither are narwhal horns, they're actually tusks, were so sought after and valuable and in short supply that most kings and such wouldn't have any. Some would be able to afford one, and a lucky few would get two of these unicorn horns. But get this, King Philip II of Spain, who is one of Spain's most important rulers of all time, I mean he's the main guy representing Spain in the Civilization games, was obsessed with unicorn horns, which were actually narwhal tusks. Well, King Philip had 12 of them, the absolute mad lad. I don't blame him though, kings are often the targets of poisoning, and unicorn horns were said to be poison cure-alls to every kind of poison, hence Galarian Ponyta's anti-poison properties. But yeah, even though the only places in Europe that narwhals live is like Svalbard and Iceland, it does have a reason for being in this region, and that's only one of the reasons. There's more. But let's talk about Cititan more specifically first, like its name. It's big. It's a titan. It's titanic. I mean, it's a cetacean. Cetitan, cetacean. It's right there. The cetacean infra order includes whales and porpoises and such. And so, of course, it's big. And also, that somewhat explains the legs. You see, we get the word cetacean from the Greek cetus, a sea monster and constellation that depicts that sea monster. But despite being a sea monster, it has legs too. Cetitan is just a Cetus, it's a sea monster. Like, what's scarier than a giant sea monster? Why, a giant sea monster that isn't limited to the sea? There are quite a few sea monsters shown on medieval and renaissance maps, especially from the most seafaring regions, so especially Spain and Portugal. One of the common sea monsters is the Staperator, an especially large titanic whale-like beast with two legs that is not to be feared, because it actually protects fishermen from other sea monsters. It's a friendly giant beast, so potentially really good to base a big, monstrous, yet friendly Pokemon on. Some consider it an Espido Shalon, another name for what in some cases is the same thing. The distinction here though is that it is the biggest sea monster, often thought to be a swimming island, and is a whale in some depictions but a sea turtle in others. But one of the defining features is that it's got spikes all over its back and face, and it's ugly. <laughs> Look at that thing. The name Espido Shalon just fits it's it, right? Though honestly, it just feels like different sailors trying to one-up each other using the same whale they happened to see while at sea. Anyway, these sea monsters had legs. And then there's the clade Sedontagodonta. I've been struggling with this word. Sedontagodonta. It also includes whales and porpoises, but also other animals like the hippopotamus and other long extinct semi-aquatic mammals whose ancestors became whales. Whales didn't directly evolve from fish. They evolved like all other 
other land dwellers from ocean creatures that evolved to be on land, but then the whale ancestors decided that they've seen enough and went back into the water. A very convoluted process, which means that cetaceans have leftover things from when they did have legs and walked on land, such as some bones from what used to be their back legs. And those bones aren't even connected to anything, they're just floating there in the body. Useless. Not doing anything. Just existing. Kinda like the titan's little thumbs, they look just as useful. Cetaceans evolved from carnivorous, even-toed ungulates, and their coldest living, land-dwelling relative is our friend, the hippo. So, the fact that the titan has hippo-looking legs and had ancestors of other cetitans that had legs, this could very well play into the whole past versus future thing that this region's theme has going on. The titan is based on whales of the past and also a Japanese cryptid. Game Freak is a Japanese developer, after all, and this is the Ningen. It is quite literally just a non-Pokemon version of this Pokemon. It's a Titan, ain't it? Like, it's just the head of a white whale with two legs or two arms based on the source. Sometimes it even has all four of them. And that honestly makes a Titan seem pretty straightforward. But there is plenty more, trust me. Like with real whales, this goes deep. Let's talk about two other whales that live in the same area as the narwhal. There's the beluga, a very, very white whale that's clearly some inspiration here, as well as inspiring a few elements of dugong. We have a video about that right here if you're interested in learning about dugong and seal. They're a lot deeper than they seem, trust me. The pink around the titan's eyes and on its hands and on its tail could be a reference to pink belugas, which is a rare mutation. But there is another whale that is probably the biggest part of the Titan puzzle, but before I show it to you, let me let me tell you, the one thing that I didn't get with Titan's design is its mouth shape. Like, how? What? That's dumb. <laughs> but it turns out that it's like that because there's a whale with a mouth just as stupid, if not stupider, because it's real. And it lives in the same area as the beluga and the narwhal. Meet the bowhead whale. Whoa, what a monster! Its skull should not look like this. That's ridiculous. Why is it shaped like this? This is the silliest looking mouth I've ever seen on a whale, and that's saying something, because all whales are accursed abominations abandoned by God. That's why they went back into the ocean. Bowheaded whales also have the largest mouth ever. It takes up almost a third of the length of its body, which I guess must be advantageous because they are also the longest lived mammals, living 200 to 260 years. Yeah. And yeah, so Titan's body is also mostly its mouth, and that mouth has the same basic shape as the bowhead whales, just a bit more cartoonized and a little more exaggerated. These whales almost look upside down compared to other whales with weird mouths, but they use this shape to eat better, I guess, but also to break through thick sheets of ice. I mean, they are mammals. They breathe air, and they live in the Arctic, which gets large ice sheets over their oceans. Imagine if they couldn't break that ice, they'd all drown. That's a terrible way to live. And similarly, the Titan have tough muscles that are able to support their immense bodies, and physical attacks using their bodies have incredible power. And I'd say, looking at all those horns, yeah, it's, it's definitely a good ice-breaking shape. It looks like a mace, a medieval bludgeoning weapon that Spain is no stranger to. And considering it's a white whale, I would love to see a pre-evolution named Belugian. It's a bludgeoning baby beluga. Belugian. But back to narwhals, because they are so awesome. Look at their tusk. Like, how? What? That's dumb. <laughs> Imagine walking around and your nose is half as long as you are. Bumping everything. Well, it turns out it's so big because it's a multi-porpoise tool. They fight mates with them, they whack their prey with them, and they use it as a sensory organ to measure depth and temperature, and sometimes narwhals do grow more than one horn, as seen here. So, Cetitan having like, a million by comparison isn't so bad after all. Fun fact, did you know that narwhal means corpse whale? Yeah, it's because the old timey people who found it first thought it was a waterlogged corpse. Wow. I mean, I guess the tuskless ones are just kind of fat and dirty, rotten belugas, aren't they? But still, other than that unicorn horn thing, what's it doing in Spain? Like, there has to be more than this. Oh, there is. Have you heard of whaling? It's sad. It's one thing when a small group of indigenous people kill a whale now and again to survive, but it's a total other thing when someone goes out and kills whales by the hundreds at a time 
and those whales are more than 3,000 kilometers away from where they live. But that's what France and Spain did. A lot. Spain even went so far as to set up the first large-scale international commercial whaling industry, building bases as far out as Newfoundland, Canada, and spreading to other places such as the West Fjords in Iceland. They killed up to 400 whales a year in the 15th through 17th centuries. Take that, Captain Ahab, you suck! Eventually, international law decided, hey, we should really stop killing the whales as quickly as they do. They're going extinct. In fact, it was the bowhead whale specifically that was devastated the most. And most of everyone agreed to stop, or at least drastically slow down, the whale killing. Spain was one of the few who did not agree, however. Bonus fact! The last massacre in Icelandic history was in 1615 and is known as the Slaying of the Spaniards. Long story short, local Icelanders murdered 32 Spanish whalers in just a few days. The Spanish were up in the Arctic killing whales a lot. Another cool aspect. Notice how Satitan has a hard-looking underbelly and blubbery top. It's like those small boats that have a hard bottom and an inflatable top. Like those made in Spain since the mid-20th century from the company named Narwhal. The plating on the bottom could also be a reference to a few different things, like the simple ridges on the bottoms of boats and ice sleds, or the tubercles on the bottom and sides of various whale species, or even the spots found on the bottom of bowhead whales' gargantuan chins. But those perfect circles in this pattern, and this being an arctic whale found around Norway and Iceland, it made me think first, of course, of Marvel's design of the Norse god Thor, who also has these six circles. Heck, DC's version of Thor, who came first by the way, and was also designed by Jack Kirby, also has these circles. But there's no clear answer as to why Thor has these either. It's not based on any particular Norse or Viking armor I can seem to find. I mean, they're no stranger to putting large round discs of metal on their wide belts and straps, but this was far from as common as these modern examples would have you believe. It might be similar to the rondels on western knight armor, which were used to protect joints and armpits like the oval ones on Sir Titan's armpit area. Or it could be like mirror armor, a style of armor used in a lot of countries in Asia and the Middle East and Eastern Europe up until the 20th century. It involved one to four discs affixed to the torso of their armor to protect those particular spots. It could also be based on the patterns on Oh, I do not know how to pronounce that word. Heitrati? Seitrati? Their armor. And they are from southern Iberia, which is just further linking us to the Iberian Peninsula with Satitan, right? And the absolute closest thing I could find to this and Thor's armor is the phalera that was given as medals to Roman soldiers and that they would wear on their armor. But as for the ancient Norse and Vikings specifically, the best I got is that on Thor and Titan, if they do have the same inspirational source, is that it's a reference to the discs on some Viking shield bosses, the metal parts that are in the middle, as well as perhaps exaggerated studs on studded armor or around those shield bosses. Medieval armor and weaponry is not our strong suit here. But notably, the Vikings did invade Spain numerous times in the 8 and 900s, perhaps bringing their whale Pokémon with them, like how Kaparaja was brought to Galar from an unnamed faraway region based on India, but it's still known as a Galarian Pokémon because that's where we saw it first, but like it's not from there originally. Could be the same with Satitan. It's from some faraway region in the north. It's just here now. Maybe Pokémon's Nordic region equivalent was selling this whale Pokémon to old-timey people of this region because of the unicorn-obsessed Spanish king. I wonder how good his teeth were. That's a bad transition to our next talking point. So Titan's bad-looking teeth. The thing is, though, they aren't teeth at all. They are baleen, or baleen, depending on how you want to speak today. Baleen are the weird toothbrush-looking bristles that most whales use instead of what we think of as teeth, and they use them to filter plankton and krill and the like. Satitan's teeth here are sort of reminiscent of that, being so tall and up and down in the placement. And I think... I think that's all I have to say about it. Do you have anything to add? I think this design is whaley well done. I'm sorry. I won't. Whale, look at the time we krilled. It's, it's been a whale, hasn't it? In the end, Satitan is quite an unusual whale Pokemon, with a mouth so big that I bet it blubbers on and on. But its design has definitely renewailed my hopes for more monstrous looking Pokemon. Maybe whale gets 12 of them. Some in the cities, some in the wilderness. 
Ha. Puns. Without puns, I'd have no purpose. Are my whale puns bad? Or are they brilliant? I love learning, and you probably do too, especially when it's hands-on, visually stimulating fun, and in a low-pressure environment. And that's why I love Brilliant, the best way to gain a deeper understanding of math, science, and STEM. Have you ever wanted to program an algorithm or neural network to get an edge in your computer science study? Do you want to become a master of logical thinking, or do you need to truly understand calculus or probability instead of just memorizing formulas you'll forget in a month? Well, learning interactively is so much better than just listening to a lecture for those kinds of things exactly. And that's where Brilliant comes in. Brilliant is constantly updating all of their courses with concepts, exercises, scientific puzzles, and interactive quizzes to keep your mind sharp or to teach you all these things for the first time. It can truly give you an edge in your education, and I love that. It's brilliant. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Loxton, or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off of Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Oh hey, the math looks like Pac-Man. Waka 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 waka. Maybe I should use Brilliant more.